How do you plan to run an organic chemistry reaction? Where do you start? What factors do you consider? This video provides a glimpse into the planning process for organic synthesis reactions. There are many factors to consider. This video is just meant to serve as an introduction. Performing an organic chemistry synthesis reaction usually includes four main steps. 1. Setup and synthesis. 2. Workup. 3. Purification. 4. Characterization. If the reaction you plan to perform is a known reaction, that is, it has done before, you could just use procedures in the literature. If it is an unknown reaction, you need to plan an experimental procedure from scratch. For simplicity, we're going to talk about one-step reactions with no intermediates involved. But in multi-step synthesis, identifying intermediates is an important step. An important factor in organic synthesis is solvent choice. For example, in this reaction, A and B react together to give product C. A and B are solids, so we need a solvent to dissolve them first, so that they can react with one another. Remember, solids won't react just by sitting in the flask. Sometimes, if possible, chemists choose a solvent in which the reactants are soluble, but the product is not. Once the product is formed, it precipitates out of the solution, making isolation easier. Another example includes the use of one of the reactants as the solvent, if the reactant is a liquid. The second question is how much of the reactants to use. The first step is to determine the balanced equation. Reactants need to be in their stoichiometric amount for the reaction to proceed. For example, let's look at bromination of this alkene. The balanced equation tells us that the ratio of alkene to bromine should be 1 to 1. So we need to calculate the mass of reactants needed based on this balanced equation. But in reality, one of the reactants is usually used in a bit of excess to make sure the reaction goes to completion. For example, the ratio of alkene to bromine could be 1 to 1.1 or even 1.2. In this case, alkene would be the limiting reagent and once it is consumed, the reaction stops. For unknown reactions, you also need to choose an appropriate concentration. Keep in mind, this also depends on the cost of material. If too expensive, smaller scale reactions are preferred. You could also consult similar reactions in the literature to determine the best concentration to try first. Based on your chosen concentration and the limiting reagent, you can then calculate the amount of reactants needed. Other factors might also affect the amount of material needed. For example, what if the reaction is in equilibrium? Then you might want to consider using one of the reactants in large excess to drive the reaction forward. An example is synthesis of an ester using acetic acid and alcohol. This reaction is in equilibrium and so you might want to consider using excess acetic acid to drive the equilibrium to the product. Just a side note, this is only one way to push the equilibrium to the right. According to Le Chatelier's principle, there are other ways to push the reaction forward. We're just using this as an example since we're talking about reactants. Another factor to think about is the rate of reaction. Remember, reactions are faster at higher temperatures. But some compounds might decompose or even evaporate at higher temperatures. One way to heat the reaction mixture at a constant temperature without losing any solvent or reactant is to use reflux. There is another video explaining reflux in details. The link is provided in the lab manual. So as you can see, there are no set in stone answers for these questions when performing an unknown reaction. This is why organic chemists do reaction optimization. Once they find an acceptable procedure, they change one variable at a time to determine the effect on, for example, the yield and or purity of the product. For example, they could change the amount of reactants, use different solvent, or heat at different temperatures. This is how you can find the optimal reaction conditions. Once you have planned a reaction procedure, you need to identify the hazards with the reactants, solvent, the anticipated products, and byproducts. 
This must be done before you perform the experiment. The starting point will be looking up information on SDS or safety data sheet. You need to determine safety information including, but not limited to, safe handling of the chemicals, flammability, toxicity, effect of air or water, and first aid procedures. After planning out the reaction, identifying the glass burn equipment, you can set up and run the reaction. This is the first step of synthesis. This step also includes monitoring the reaction progress, which we won't discuss now. Once the reaction is done, the next step is workup, which includes isolating the product from the reaction mixture. Let's go over a few examples. If the product precipitates out of the reaction, then one can simply use vacuum filtration to separate the solids from liquid. The mixture is passed through a funnel, the solid stays on the funnel, while the liquid passes through by vacuum. If the reaction has been heating, cooling down the reaction mixture might also result in product precipitation, which again can be collected using vacuum filtration. If precipitation is not possible, or if the product is liquid, then one can use extraction to isolate the product. Extraction takes advantage of solubility to move a compound from one phase, for example, the organic phase to another phase, for example, the aqueous phase, and thus separates it from the mixture. There is another video explaining extraction in details and so we won't get into the details here. The link to the extraction video is in the lab map. The product we get after isolation is called crude product, as it is most likely not pure. There might be traces of solvent, unreacted starting materials, or byproducts. So the next step is purification to remove impurities. The choice of purification techniques depends on the reaction and product. Here are a few important techniques. 1. Distillation. This technique is used to purify liquids by separating them based on their boiling points. 2. Recrystallization. This technique is used to purify solid compounds and is based on solubility. 3. Chromatography techniques. In these techniques, compounds are purified based on their affinity for stationary versus mobile phase. Now that we have the pure product, we need to identify it by determining its structure. This is called characterization. The most frequently used characterization techniques in organic synthesis are 1. Infrared or IR spectroscopy for short, which is used to identify functional groups. 2. Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Spectroscopy, or NMR for short, to determine the structure. 3. Mass Spectroscopy to determine relative molecular mass. 4. Determining the melting points for solids. Keep in mind that characterization is usually done for crude product as well. This is to make sure we can identify the product before proceeding to the purification step. So to conclude, we talked about some of the factors which need to be considered before carrying out a chemical synthesis reaction, such as solvent choice and amount of chemicals needed. We also reviewed the four main steps in organic synthesis reactions and some of the techniques used for each step. Though planning and carrying out organic synthesis might sound a bit tedious, it is actually a fun process. After all, you're creating something new. Thank you for watching.